Hello everyone, today's video will be the second installment of the How to Get Better at Smite series. It's been a while since I made the first one and I didn't really have any ideas that I was really happy with or that I really wanted to set in stone for the second one. But just yesterday I decided that I wanted to talk about the item shop and building and counter building and everything revolving around items and how they work in Smite. The reason I wanted to do this is because I think every else, every other part of Smite is pretty straightforward. As far as abilities, I mean, a lot of games these days have abilities. Even Valorant, the new game that everybody's playing, that's a game with abilities that is a first-person shooter. Just auto-attacking people is pretty straightforward, stuff like that. But I think the, the most confusing and maybe the most important part of Smite and maybe other MOBAs, I can't really speak for them because I don't really play them, is the item shop and how you build and everything like that. And I think it can be pretty confusing for new players and sometimes even advanced or even maybe sometimes pro players if you watch the SPL. So in today's video, we're just going to be talking all about items and all that good stuff. Try and teach you guys everything that I know. So I think we need to lay down some foundations before we get into the more advanced stuff, especially for the new players out there trying to understand the item shop. We need to understand that all the gods in Smite, every single one, is balanced around the item shop, which means that items are very important to each god's kit. And every god, every unique god, can use certain items better than others, and maybe other items worse. A prime example of how important items are to a god's kit is King Arthur with Glad Shield. King Arthur has been really good ever since his release, but it's mainly because of this single item alone. King Arthur is a stance switching combo god, so he basically always has an ability up because he has 9 abilities, which means he can be constantly proccing Glad Shield, especially because all of those abilities are AoE, which means he can hit multiple gods, which means he can get multiple heals. If this item wasn't in the game, I don't want to say he'd be irrelevant, but he definitely wouldn't be as good as he has been for the past year. A simple yet very important thing we need to talk about is the types of damage in Smite. So there's physical and magical damage. Assassins do physical damage. Warriors do physical damage. Guardians do magical damage. Mages also do magical damage. And hunters do physical damage. Which means that there's three classes that do physical damage and two classes that do magical damage. This would make you think, in theory, that physical damage is a little bit more valuable since there's more classes and more opportunities to be defensive against it. To add on to that, towers, phoenixes, minions, objectives, they all do physical damage which means that physical defense in general will be a little bit more valuable on the conquest map. Now the point of this video isn't to just show you each optimal build for every single god because like I said every god does have an optimal build and it will be unique to that character. The point of this video is basically to teach you how to fish instead of giving you a fish for a day if you want to look at it that way. I want to try and show you guys how to understand um, why items are good on certain gods and whenever a new god comes out how you can theory craft for yourself on what items you think would be good for them and what you can do with it. So generally speaking in Smite, there's a term called scaling or item scaling, which just basically means how much usefulness you get out of an item for God's ability or their kit. There's two classes in Smite whose characters have very high scaling on their abilities, and that's going to be the assassins and the mages. So the more physical power that you build on assassins, the more usefulness they're going to get out of the items because all of their abilities have really high scaling, which means they're just going to be doing a lot more damage than other characters would with those items. And the same thing goes for mages. The more magical power you build on these characters, for example, let's just take Scylla, 80% on her 1, 90% on her 2, obviously her 3s are escape, 120% on her ults. That's the, these are the numbers for the scaling. That's the percentage of magical power you're getting from your items that's going to be contributing to your abilities. So, like I said, the more power you build on both these classes, the more useful they're going to be with these damaging abilities. Now the flip side of that are going to be characters that have really high base damage but not great scaling. And these are going to be the tank classes of Smite, which are your warriors and your guardians. These characters make better use out of tank items, hybrid items, and utility items because the longer they stay in a fight, the more tanky they are, the more uses they get out of their base damage numbers on their abilities. Now the only odd one out class is going to be the hunter class whose characters don't really have the best scaling on their abilities, but they do have good attack speed steroids, they rely on physical range auto attacks to do their damage, and they're kind of the carries this might in the sense that they do most of the DPS, consistent DPS, especially against objectives and stuff like that. All of these reasons make them more prone to, build, uh, to be building items that have like good attack speed on them, or you know go into the crit route, anything that just makes them shred a lot more on a consistent basis with their auto attacks. Now I want to look at some of the staple items from each class so we can get a better understanding of why we build certain items. For the Guardians and the Warriors, Breastplate has been the go-to item for as long as I can remember. And the reason for this is the stats that it gives you for the cost of it 
synergize very well with itself and for the characters that you build it on. So right now it has 65 physical protection, 300 mana, 10 MP5, 20% cooldown reduction. I say right now because, you know, the game's constantly patched and this may change in the future. A year from now, this may not have the same stats or maybe it's not even in the game. And if you're watching this from the past, I think at one time it had 25% cooldown reduction, I think 70 prots or something. So it's been changed here and there. But for the most part, it stayed relatively the same. And for that reason, it's also bought relatively the same amount in almost every game on almost every solo laner. Sometimes I mean in other roles. Uh, because it gives you 65 physical prot, which is very valuable on the conquest map. 300 mana, 10 MP5, very good for characters that want to be spamming their abilities and have that mana sustain. And that also combines and synergizes well with the 20% cooldown reduction because you're just going to be spamming your abilities more in the team fight, especially if you're a tank who's going to be in the team fight for longer, especially with the, the physical protections that it gives you. So all in all, it just synergizes so well with itself for a cheap cost of 2300 gold. Now, it's not the cheapest item in the game, but for the stats that it gives you, that's very cost effective. And the more that you play and the more you mess around with the item shop, the more you realize how important the cost of items are. And that's really the point I want to drive home in this video is how important the cost of items are and the stats that it gives you for that cost. So basically, just cost efficiency. Now for the Assassin's class, Jotun's is going to be the staple item that's been bought throughout the years. Um, right now, it's not the greatest item. It's not the most optimal item just because it doesn't give you as much damage as some of the other items in the game. You can get CDR from stuff like Erendite, Transcendence, Hydra, so you don't really need the 20% CDR from this item. But all in all, throughout Smite's career, Jotun's has been one of the best or most bought items on Assassin's. And you can't really go wrong with building this item at most levels of play, so no no really uh, need to worry about it. But just looking at the stats, it gives you 40 physical power, 150 mana, 10 physical penetration, and 20% cooldown reduction, which are all really nice stats. 40 physical power and 10 penetration, obviously good for characters with high scaling, which assassins do have. So the 10 penetration is going to really help um, push through the physical power that you have and the base damage that you have on your, your assassins. And also the cooldowns so that you're just using your abilities a little bit more often. Um, like I said, cooldown I think is a little bit more valuable on tanks just because their base damage is really high. But it's not it's not awful on uh, assassins either, especially assassins with utility like Thor. Um, utility in the sense that he has a stun on his two. So any character like that, um, the more cooldowns you're going to be using, the better. And that's part of the reason it's just been such a staple of the, the kit. It just kind of gives you everything you need. It gives you that physical power for the scaling, the penetration, so you can actually do more with the scaling. And then that cooldown reduction for, you know, assassins in general do have some pretty good utility. So, now Book of Thoth has been the staple or go-to item for mages for a very long time as well. And the reason for this is pretty simple. Since mages are a class that rely on a lot of magical power for their scaling, Book of Thoth is an item that gives you a lot of magical power for the scaling. <laughs> so um, once it's fully stacked, it's a little deceiving because it says base 80 magical power. But once it's fully stacked and you convert your mana over to magical power, it gives you a crap ton of power. And um, it always has for the past six years, seven years. It's been the go-to item. Um, and in general, mages have a lot of mana on their items as well. And since the passive converts mana into power, you're just generally speaking going to have a lot more power once you build this item and once you start getting it stacked. Now, the only um, downside is that it's a little bit more expensive. But for the two classes of hunter and mage, hunters and mages are the late game carries. And they're also um, the two roles that can get a lot more farm funneled into them, which means that they can be a little bit more greedy with the items that they build. They can go for a little bit more expensive items because the stats that they give them are going to be a little bit better in general um, than some of the cheaper uh, damage items that they can go for. And they can just be a little bit more greedy in their roles because they get a little bit more farm and they're expected come late game to output the damage in the DPS. And then last but not least, Executioner for Hunters is a must, a necessary item in every Hunter build. Um, not only because it gives you some decent stats in 30 power, 25% attack speed, that's not nothing crazy for 2350. That's probably not worth it. But what is worth it is the passive. You get up to 36% physical protection tread on the passive. And it's a job, the, the Hunter's job late game is to hit what's in front of them. And most of the time that's going to be a tank. Therefore, they should have items that can shred that tank's defense so they can actually you know output some DPS on them and kill them. Not only that, but Executioner works on Gold Fury. It works on uh, Fire Giant, which means that you're going to be able to reduce those objectives' uh, physical protections, making it a little bit easier to DPS them down and shred them. So all in all, it's just a necessary item. For, for the Hunter's job, it just makes perfect sense, and you can't really go wrong with it just because it gives you some decent base stats for the gold and then with a very worthwhile passive. The reason I wanted to go over those staple items for a bit and kind of explain it to you guys 
is that Smite is a game that is constantly being changed, right? It's basically updated every two weeks, and item balance is at the top priority of every single one of those changes. Items are constantly being changed in the game. You know, OP items are being nerfed, and then the items that aren't really bought that much are trying to be buffed or maybe reworked um, completely. Items are basically... Sometimes they're completely changed. They go from like a physical defense item to not even being in the game or like a magical defense item to a physical defense item. Basically, a year from now, the entire item shop can be different. But I wanted to show you guys some items that have stayed consistent throughout all the years of Smite just so you can get a foundation of why those classes build the items for for the gods' kits in those classes, right? Um, because at the end of the day, if you have no idea what you're doing in the building in the, the item shop when you're building, and there's a new character in the game, and you're pretty new to the game, at least you can think back to one item that makes sense on that god's kit and try to build your way around that, right? So say I'm playing Kuyi, and he's a new god. He just came out for whatever reason. If um, you know that Executioner is one of the staple items for this kit, it may be different in the future. It may be... Um, may have been different in the past but if you were watching this video and learn from it that the attack speed that you get from it and the pen shred that you get on the passive was like a useful thing to have on a hunter then you can kind of build around that and say well maybe i should build something that will help me with the executioner by shredding tanks maybe kin size will help with that because it does health percent damage which is obviously going to be good for tanks who have a little bit more health right so there you go now you already have an item to build off with your executioner um, maybe you can throw in another attack speed item so that you can proc your executioner a little bit faster because you need three procs of it to get the maximum effect out of it. Um, so stuff like that. And that's just kind of what I, I wanted to talk about with those items. It just kind of gives you a foundation for each class and kind of helps you build a little bit more efficiently. So now let's talk about the job of each role on the conquest map so that you can build accordingly for it. For the hunter class, it's usually going to be a physical hunter. Sometimes some mage ADCs are played and occasionally some other stuff here and there, but for the most part, it's going to be the physical hunter class. The job of the hunter is to hit what's in front of him, which is usually going to be tanks, occasionally squishy characters, characters with not a lot of defense. Um, but most of the time, they're going to be focusing down the front line because that's going to be who is diving them. That's the only person they can really hit because they're being zoned by them. It's also their job to shred objectives like we talked about before, Gold Fury and Fire Giant. And then it's also their job, or at least something that happens a lot of the time, is that they stick with their, their backliner, their mid laner a lot of the time, and they 2v2 or 2v3 the tanks that are in front of them while they're being dove. So it just kind of makes sense for them to build some items that can kill tanks, stuff for attack speed so that they can shred objectives, and also lifesteal so they can tank those objectives and tank the, the um, frontliners that are diving them and try and survive through it. For the support role, it's mainly the Guardian class, sometimes the Warrior class, and occasionally in certain metas the Assassin class. But for the most part, it's going to be the Guardians. The role of the support is to stick with their backline a lot of the time and peel. Sometimes, on occasion, they'll dive the backline, but they're going to be sticking with their Hunter and their Mage a lot of the time as well. And that's why aura items are really good for them to try and help out their team, whether it's offensive aura items like Pythags or Shogun Skusari or defensive aura items like uh, Gauntlet of Thieves, Sovereignty, Heartward. The reason these items are so good on the supports is, well, they're supporting their team, they're sticking with them, and these aura items will help them with that. Not only that, it's their job to be really tanky because they're one of the frontliners of the game combined with the solo laner. Um, they're the first frontliner because they soak up a lot of the damage and oftentimes they're the initiator. So you want to be building tank items on these characters almost always, especially cheap tank items because supports are usually a little bit behind in farm because they're the lowest level on the map and they have to share a lot of their farm. And that's just how it's going to be for you stupid supports out there. Just kidding. I'm sorry. I'm so rude. Um, but yeah, so they're a frontliner. They need to be building cheap defensive items and or items for the most part so they can help out their team. Now the mid laner's job is pretty straightforward as well. They're the other backliner on the conquest map combined with the hunter. They're also going to be doing a lot of the damage come late game, but their damage is going to be a little bit different in the sense that it's AoE damage and it's more burst damage than it is consistent DPS. That's why power and penetration make a lot of sense on mages in the mid lane. But it's also the job of the mid laner to secure objectives around the map like Gold Fury, Fire Giant, Pyromancer, sometimes the Titan, and sometimes just small buff camps around the map. Since most of these characters have very high burst abilities in their kit, let's just take Isis for example, her circle of protection, this can easily hit for over 2,000 come late game. Because of this, it's their job to make sure they secure the objective for their team when they're DPSing down the objective with their hunter in the back line. Now the jungle role is pretty simple as well. It's usually dominated by the assassin class, but sometimes you'll see warriors or mages there. Basically any character with high mobility and high burst is going to be good there because it's the job of the jungler to roam around the map and impact the map as much as possible, especially lanes. Whether it's through ganking, invading, pulling uh, objectives and forcing fights around their team, they're basically the primary damage dealer in the early to mid and even late game 
and they're going to be diving with their soul laner a lot of the time. While the soul laner will tank up a lot of damage, like we'll talk about next, they're going to be building a lot more damage so that they can burst down and punish the the mid laner, the the hunter or ADC role um, as often as they can for having their actives down. And last but certainly not least, we have the soul lane, which is my role. Now, the soul lane has been dominated by warriors and guardians for the most part in the past six years, but almost every class has been viable in the lane at some point. But warriors and guardians are the best just because they're the best tank roles in Smite. And it's the job of the soul laner to be the second tank on the map combined with the support. It's their job to tank the objectives on the map, whether it's Gold Fury, Fire Giant, Towers, Phoenixes, even Titans sometimes. But it's also their job to dive the enemy backline and tank the enemy Hunter and Mage and sometimes the support if the support is peeling. This opens up a lot of room and opportunity for the jungler to go in, which is the main person that the soul laner works with. The jungler and soul lane have to work hand in hand almost always to dive the backline. The soul laner will be tanking the damage and taking a lot of the abilities and soaking that up with their defense items, while the jungler with their burst items and their damage items will clean up the carries um, pretty easily once the, the soul laner makes a lot of room and opportunity for them. But it also creates a lot of room for their backline because the further you can push their backline away from your backline, the less likely that the damage dealers on their team will be able to make it to your backline and punish them. Also, in my opinion, soul lane is going to require the most thought for whenever you're building because not only do you have to win your 1v1 in lane because it's kind of the role that has the most 1v1 potential, but also you need to worry about whenever you're diving the backline, what items you have for their ADC or maybe for their mage. Uh, maybe they have two mages, so you need to worry about getting a little bit more magical defense. Maybe they have two physical hunters, you need to get a little bit more attack speed slow items or physical defense items. You kind of have to think about that always and how you can really... Um, balance out your build so that you can win a 1v1, but also do well into the uh, enemy characters that you're diving late game. In other roles, such as like the hunter role or even the mid lane role with mages, sometimes there's just mathematically a best build, if you will, because it outputs the most DPS, right? Um, for example, hunters in the history of Smite have usually built Devos, Boots, Executioner, Kin Size, Titan's Bane, Odysseus Bow, just because it kind of just outputs the most DPS to hit the people in front of them and owns them pretty much no matter what. You can't really go wrong with the build. But soloing, you kind of change your build almost every game. There's going to be a general build or a general few core items on each god, but for the most part, it's going to be different because you're going to always have to be worrying about counter building almost everyone on the map. Now we're going to go through the lightning round of stat caps and how items interact with each other, just so that you guys are building efficiently and effectively as possible. Um, it's small, but very important information that not everybody knows, so we're just going to go through that real quick in one take. Starting off with attack speed, the attack speed cap is going to be 2.5. A lot of characters in this game, especially physical characters, have attack speed steroids in their kit, which means that you can overcap pretty easily if you build too much attack speed on characters that have like a 50% attack speed steroid. The only exception to this, or I guess interaction, that maybe may, might make you want to think about it, is Silver Branch Bow, the passive. For every 0 0.02 attack speed that you go over the cap, you actually get 1.5 physical power. So it's something you could look to theorycraft with, but for the most part in this current meta, it's not very viable. It could change down the road. Now as far as power, there is no power cap in the game. It says 400. But for the most part, to get over 400, you're going to be using a red buff, you're going to be using fire giant and all that stuff, which lets you overcap it. Lifesteal for physicals, it's going to be 100, 100%, so you can get up to 100% physical lifesteal, which means for however much damage you output, you will have stolen that back and given it to yourself, so 100%. But for magicals, it's going to be 60%. Keep that in mind. It's going to be different than the physicals. Flat penetration, so if you go to the penetration tab, there's two different types of penetration. There's going to be the flat pen, which is obviously just a number, plus 15 penetration, right? And there's going to be percentage pen. These interact differently with each other and against different gods and against uh, different items. But the flat pen cap is going to be 50. So if you were to build all these items, you'd be at 30 with these, you'd be at 40. This item doesn't give you flat pen, but let's say you get Aussie, you'd be at 55. So you'd actually be over capped, so you'd be losing out on 5 pen um, effectively there. So the flat pen cap is going to be 50. Any more than you build than that is going to be um, useless, basically. Um, and on Thanatos, Thanatos gets 35 flat pen on his two. So you actually don't have to build a lot of flat pen on him just because you're going to be overcapping pretty quickly. Uh, percent physical pen is going to be 80%, but it's impossible to get to that because percentage pen, the way it works in this game, is it's multi multiplicative, I guess. I don't know how to say that word. But like I said, one take. So it's going to be uh, up to 40% here. And then the only other item that gives you percentage uh, physical pen is going to be Executioner, and I guess Void Shield. But the way they work is they don't add up together, so it's not going to be 36% plus 40%. 
it's going to be multiple kit, which is about 56% or 60%, something like that. So basically they work a little less effectively together, but sometimes, um, not always, it doesn't mean that it's a cardinal sin to build them together. Now, critical chance can also get up to 100% critical chance, which means you're going to be critting every time you hit an auto, which is pretty nasty. The protection cap for both physical and magical is going to be 325, okay? There is only one exception, I believe, or maybe two, two or three exceptions to this. Fenrir ult, it gives him um, double protections if he has full runes, so you can actually get up to 650 protections of each, which is pretty crazy. Obviously, not that... Um, um, applicable, but you know, it's still just a nice little thing. I think Achilles too can also give you extra protections, which will overcap you. So you can't overcap in those instances, but as far as items go, you cannot get um, over the cap from just building a bunch of items. So do not try and build over the cap by going 16 physical protection items, right? Health, a soft cap of five. 5,500, but you can also overcap that, I'm almost sure. And I think it's almost impossible to overcap that just because you only have six items and there's only so much health that you can be that can be gained from items. Um, HP5 is going to be capped at 100. Same thing with MP5. So both of these are going to be capped at 100 um, back and forth. Cooldown, the cap is going to be 40%. So if I were to build Breastplate, not saying you should build this, definitely do not. But um, if you're to build Breastplate and Jotuns together, you're already at 40%. This means that you're at full CDR, which means you are no longer able to build anymore. And your abilities will be the shortest cooldowns that they can possibly be. The only exception to this is Cronus Pendant and Genji's. So Cronus Pendant, um, I'm on Achilles right now, so we'll show Genji's first. Genji's, it reduces the passive, makes it reduce by three seconds. So it's can, it can allow you to overcap a little bit in a sense, just because you already have the maximum amount of percentage cooldown. But then it gives you a passive that will re reduce all of your abilities by three seconds whenever you get hit by a magical um, item. So it doesn't interact the same. And the same thing with Cronus Pendant. Cronus Pendant does have 20% CDR on it. Oops, I guess we can do this. It does have 20% CDR on it, but the passive also subtracts one second from all your cooldowns every 10 seconds, which does not interact with the percentage cooldown that you get from the base stats. So those allow you to overcap a little bit, but I don't recommend just building them for that reason and overcapping by a lot. There are some scenarios where overcapping CDR is fine. Um, if the item you're building, you're building just for the base stats plus the passive. For example, if I had 40% CDR in a tank build, and I wanted to get Mantle just for the survivability that it adds, 60 of each prop, which is really nice, and then also the CC immunity and stun that it gives you in the passive, then you can go it, and you can have 50% CDR, and you won't really feel that bad about it. But whenever you're trying to build as efficiently as possible, then think about trying not to overcap in CDR. The same thing goes for CCR. The cap on that is 40%. So if we can, is I don't think you can actually tick it. No, you can't. Yeah, yeah, you can't. Um, so tank boots, I know it gives you 20% CZR. So I'm already halfway there. If I were to go tank boots in a build and then I could get mystical, mystical also gives you 20% CCR. I'm already at the CCR cap right now. And CCR is just crowd control reduction, which basically means that if a stun lasts for one second and I have 40% CCR, it'll now last for 0.6 seconds. So that's basically how it works as long as you're not DR'd or diminishing returns, which is a concept for another video. I'm trying to get through this as fast as possible in the lightning round. So yeah, 40% on the crowd control reduction. Mana has a soft cap of 4,000. I don't think it's possible to get past that anyway. So I don't think it's something you really have to worry about all that much. For some reason, okay, it wasn't showing me my gods. Um, so mana has a soft cap. No big reason to worry about that. Um, movement speed. So movement speed is a little bit weird. There, um, The way movement speed works is there's diminishing returns on the more movement speed you build. So if I were to build the fastest boots in the game, which are Valeria boots, and then I also to go Wing Blade, and then I also went something like Atlantis Bow into a, like Relic Dagger. At this point, I'm going to be very, very fast. All of my items are giving me movement speed, right? But the more movement speed I build, the less effectiveness I'm going to get out of each movement speed item, right? So I think it starts to fall off around three or four items. So if I were to build two more movement speed items here, it's going to be DR'd pretty hard, or I'm going to get some uh, big diminishing returns from it. So it's probably not all that great to go for it unless I'm just trying to meme or have fun and run around really fast. So if you can see my items right here, I have 521 from that. I have 491 from that. So I gained 20. If I went Atalanta's here, I gained 20 base uh, movement speed. If I add it to the build, it gave me 20 or 30 rather. And then I go for another wing blade or a wind demon, not a wind demon, a witch blade, which will give me 10%. And I add it to the build. I only got 19 from that. So you see how it's uh, reducing or it's going down. If I go Wingblade from that and I add it to the build, 
it will let... Oh, I already have a Winged Blade. Oops. If I go a Hasten Katana, because that gives you 10% movement speed. I only got 19 from that, so you kind of just see that you're getting less effectiveness, effectiveness out of it because of the uh, diminishing returns. Sorry, it's hard to speak going through this in all in one take. Um, But I think that covers it. The magical damage cap or magical power cap is 1,000, but again, you don't have to worry about it because it's a soft cap, which means you can overcap it, especially with like a red buff, fire giant, um, all that good stuff. And I'm pretty sure that covers all the stat caps in the game. Next, real quick, we'll cut it real quick, but we'll talk about the items and how they interact with each other. Now, the way anti-heal works in Smite is that it's additive, which means that you can get to 100% anti-heal pretty quickly if you wanted to. If you were to combine a Brawler, a Contagion, and a Toxic Blade, you'd be at 105% anti-heal, 40% from Brawlers, 25% from Contagion, and 40% once you get the Toxic Blade stacked up, which means that 100% of the enemy de enemy team's healing or regeneration will be completely negated. They'll be getting 0% effectiveness out of it, which is a really good um, thing to know when it comes to counter building against healers or any like self-sustaining characters in Smite. Another thing to really keep in mind when it comes to anti-heal is that it works against any form of regeneration in Smite. Any form of HP 5, health chalice, health pots, lifesteal, any heal or health regeneration or percentage health regeneration, fire giant sustain, anti-heal works against all of it. So keep that in mind. That's what makes anti-heal so important when it comes to smite, especially with the healing characters in the game. Something also to keep in mind when it comes to anti-heal is that pestilence and contagion, although different items, one gives magical defense, the other gives physical defense, since they're considered to have the same aura, they're just both different options to be counterbuilt against different team comps, some that are more physical dominant, some that are more magical dominant. Since they're both considered the same aura, they do not stack with each other. So even though it's 25% here, 25% here, you do not get to 50% if you build these two items um, together. Speaking of aura items, aura items do not stack with each other. So if somebody on your team were to build a sovereignty, and you were also to build a sovereignty, and you were to stand next to each other in that aura, in the units that it, you know, it actually specifies, 70 units, you do not get a double stack of that to effectiveness out of it. And this goes for every single aura item, Apart from Mystical Mail, Mystical Mail is more of an offensive war item. It does damage in an area around yourself. So that means if you were standing next to a teammate with Mystical and you yourself had Mystical, you'd actually be doing 80 magical damage per second instead of 80, or instead of 40, rather. Um, another thing to keep in mind with or items is Cad Shield and Rod of Asclepius do not work in the same way that Anti-Heal works. They used to work like that, but Cad Shield and Rod of Asclepius... They only increase healing from ability, so they don't increase the HP 5 I was talking about. They don't increase life steal, the health pots, the Baron's Bruise, the fire giants of the game. They don't increase those healing whatsoever. They used to a long time ago, but for now, if you're watching this in any meta, hopefully they didn't change this. Um, but So on the opposite side of anti-heal, they do not work in the same way. Anti-heal works against everything. Cat Shield and Rodus Clepius only work for healing abilities. Keep in mind that Midgardian does stack with Witchblade when it comes to the attack speed slow passives, but it doesn't stack with Frostbound. And the way attack speed slows work in Smite is that they DR a good bit as well, so I would not ever recommend building a Midgardian, a Witchblade, a Frostbound, a Horrific, all these things to just, you know, conjure up a huge con concoction of attack speed slows. Um, but when you are playing against the characters that do rely on a lot of their attack speed, it would be nice to get, maybe get a Midgardian or a Witchblade here and there, especially like against like a Kali, against a lot of ADCs, maybe a double Hunter comp, um, something like that. When it comes to Relics, unless something major changes in the next few years, um, it's been this way for the longest time, the mid lane and the Hunter role almost always will be going Beads and Aegis as their actives. You might have heard me say actives in this video already, but they're called Relics now. When Smite first came out and for a while they were called actives, they're called Relics. Um, but Beads and Aegis are going to be the go-tos just because you're building full damage on these characters and there's a ton of CC in Smite, hence the Purification Bead so that you are immune to crowd control for two seconds to make sure that you don't get CC'd and bursted down and to really make sure that you don't get bursted down by all the, the bursts in Smite because there's a crap ton of that too. You want to have Aegis, which will make you immune to damage for 1.5 seconds. And if you upgrade both of these, they will also be reduced in cooldown. This is pretty much the go-to relics almost always on these characters. Um, sometimes you'll see like a, a shell here or there just for a little bit of tankiness and the absorb stacks on the passive for um, blocking like a jungler who's diving you. But we won't really talk about it that much because I think if you were to watch this video two years from now, Beads and Aegis would still be the go-to. 
For the tank rolls, it's not as straightforward. They're going to be situational relics basically every game, and you're going to have to change it based on what the enemy team comp has and what your team comp has and all that good stuff. And that's why you'd watch a video like this. For the support role, anything that helps out your team, especially in an AoE, because you're going to be in the middle of everybody, especially your backline, stuff that can help peel for them, like shell and sprint are good. Um, anything that can help you initiate a fight and right, you know, instantly get a CC on somebody that's pretty far away from you. Blink's really good for that. Frenzy to help out your team around objectives and just to do more overall DPS. All of these relics work really well in support right now and possibly in the future just because they help out the team and that's the role of the support. Now the jungler's relics, the go-to options are going to be beads, agus, and blink. Beads and agus make a lot of sense on junglers just because you're going to be building full damage almost always, um, which means that you're going to have to have that that option to be a little bit more defensive so that you don't get bursted down in those mid to late game team fights. And then Blink has been meta for junglers for a very long time just because it allows you to do your exact job on the map, which is impact everywhere. Impact lanes by ganking, invading, setting up fights. And Blink just allows you to catch people off guard and set up plays that you otherwise would not have been able to just because you would have had to have used your escape to catch up to the enemy team. Blink allows you to instantly get a CC off, instantly get a lot of burst or damage off, and put people out of a position that otherwise would not have been able to. And well, that's really all there is to it, guys. There's probably a lot more information out there that I could give you, but the point of this video was trying to give you guys like the foundations of how to think about building, of how to understand how to like theorycraft and all that, so that you can kind of go about it for yourselves and be more independent and theorycraft some builds. And like I said early on in the video, kind of teach you guys how to fish and not give you a fish for a day. So hopefully I was able to do that. If you are really, really trying to find the most optimal build for every god in the game, I have gameplays on my YouTube for that. I have certain god guides that you can really look into and how like certain items will really, really affect certain gods' kits and stuff like that. You can always watch my stream. You can ask me questions on my YouTube or in my stream. I'll try and always answer that to the best of my ability. But hopefully, um, off of this video, whether you're a beginner, whether you're more intermediate, and if you're more advanced, then, well, you probably don't need a lot of help building anyway if you're more advanced. But if you're anywhere in that um, that large spectrum, hopefully you're able to get a, a better understanding of how items work in Smite and what you can do with them. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much it. Like I said, if you have any questions, let me see them in the comments below and I'll do my best to answer them. Other than that, what what do you guys want to see next in the How to Get Better at Smite series? Um, this is just something that I kind of thought of and I don't know if there were any YouTube videos on it. I literally didn't even check. Who knows? I guess we'll see after I upload this video, but yeah, let me know what you want to see next. Anything specific that you want to try and get better at that you think I could help you with? Um, let me know in the comments. But other than that, I hope you guys enjoyed the video and you learned something. I'll see you guys next time. Peace out, everybody. Stay safe and stay healthy.